Uh, it's with great pleasure then that I can welcome uh, our speaker this afternoon, who is no stranger to the Wesley Historical Society. Uh, Professor Bill Gibson is director of the Oxford Centre for Methodism and Church History, where the lecture is being held this afternoon, and also, of course, professor of ecclesiastical history at Oxford Brookes University. He's published widely on religion, politics, society uh, since the Restoration in 1660 and right through the long 18th century with a particular focus and a particular specialism uh, in the workings of the Church of England in that period. Uh, he has published widely, hot off the press, is a study of the bishops of the Church of England in the 18th century, the Anglican Episcopate from 1689 to 1800, published by the University of Wales Press, which is great to see. And in 2021, Bill also wrote uh, a study of Samuel Wesley uh, and the crisis of the Tory party between 1685 and 1720. And it's from that book, I'm assuming, that the subject of today's lecture grows and is a development and emerges. As you can see on the screen, uh, Bill's title is John Wesley's debt to his father, Samuel. Let's give Bill a warm welcome and then over to Bill. Thank, thank you very much indeed, David. Um, it's become one of the many myths of Methodism that the movement was heavily influenced by John and Charles Wesley's mother, Susanna. A check on WorldCat reveals that 270 books have been devoted in whole or in part to Susanna Wesley. Some of these explicitly suggest that she was, as is sometimes claimed, the source of John and Charles Wesley's evangelicalism and therefore of the Methodist movement. This is certainly the implication of Elsie Harrison's 1934 book, A Son to Susanna, and Mabel Brailsford's 1938 Mother, Susanna Wesley, A Mother of Methodism, a title also used by Mary Greetham's 2003 volume, and of course, many others. Some of the books suggest that she was a source of religious radical influences on her sons. Works with this message include Donald King's, uh, sorry, Donald Klein's 1980 work, Susanna Wesley, God's Catalyst for Revival, and Marion Fields' 1998 work, Susanna Wesley, A Radical in the Rectory. The recognition of Susanna Wesley's role in the formation of Methodism was commemorated in Philip Atkinson's musical on Susanna's life called Dear Mother in 1989. And if any of you had, have, have any information on that musical, I'd be very keen to receive it. Susanna is also, of course, enshrined in a stained glass window in Liverpool Cathedral as Susanna Wesley devoted mother. The celebration of the 350th anniversary of her birth in 2017 was a further occasion to acknowledge her influence. The conference at the University of Lincoln was titled The Bright Succession after Susanna Wesley, Gender, Heritage and Faith and showed some of the ways in which Susanna has been interpreted. Outwardly, of course, it's easy to compare Susanna's irregular prayer meetings in the kitchen at Epworth with John Wesley's later unauthorized field preaching. Perhaps Susanna Wesley's political resistance to her husband could be seen as an analogy for Wesley's relationship with the Church of England. And Susanna's upbringing in a dissenting household was perhaps also a model for how Methodism would turn out after John Wesley's death. Certainly, the fact that women made up a sizable majority of the early Methodist adherents seems also to imply a debt to Susanna. However, it's my contention that this is a reductive and misleading interpretation. As I've argued elsewhere, Susanna's theological and political views were inconsistent if not incoherent. She may have had an influence on John Wesley's general spiritual values, 
but it seems implausible that her diffuse and conflicting views on, on other things had much influence. Her embrace of both non-juring principles and her recommendation of John Locke to her sons suggests that Susanna's political views were, at best, paradoxical. Moreover, the elevated view of Susanna's influence underplays the degree to which her husband Samuel had an impact on the ideas of John and Charles. And it's on this topic today that I want to talk, the debt of John and Charles to their father. It's clear that John, Charles and their elder brother Samuel all held their father in considerable regard and esteem. In his, in his father's last years, Samuel Wesley Jr. wrote a poem entitled The Parish Priest, which was clearly meant to be a portrait of Samuel Wesley. The opening lines were evident, evidence that it was written from the perspective of filial duty. It began, accept, dear sire, this humble tribute paid, this small memorial to a parent's shade. Samuel Wesley Jr. Uh, gave an account of his father as a parish a priest, not of the pilgrim kind, but fixed and faithful to the post assigned. Through various scenes with equal virtue, virtue trod, true to his oath, his order, and his God. The poem was a rose-tinted, if not to say inaccurate, account of Samuel's life and work as a parson. It invented all sorts of things. Among them was the claim, repeated elsewhere, that Samuel Wesley had preached a sermon in 1688 in defiance of, Samuel, of James II's declaration of indulgence. This was self-evidently untrue, since Samuel wasn't in holy orders in May 1688, and certainly didn't have a pulpit to preach from. In fact, as we'll see, Samuel was a strong supporter of James II right up to the revolution of 1689. The poem romanticized, if not distorted, his relations with dissenters and the other parishioners and ended with the encomium, steadfast, not stiff, and awful, not austere, though courteous, reverend, and though smooth, sincere in converse free for every subject fit, the coolest reason joined to keenest wit. It may have been a hagiographical retelling of Samuel Wesley's life, but it represented how his sons wished to imagine his life to have been, rather than perhaps how it was. So we need to separate Samuel Wesley as he was from the Samuel Wesley as he, li as he lived in his son's imaginations. However, we can make an assumption that even in negative terms, Samuel Wesley had a significant impact on his son's lives, since none of the three of them followed him into parish ministry. This is a quite remarkable feat, to have three ordained sons, none of whom decided to follow their father in holding a parish living. The 18th century clergy had a tendency to be a hereditary profession. One estimate is that half of the clergy came from the sons of Parsons. And if grandfathers are included, that figure becomes a considerable majority. The three ordained sons of Samuel Wesley were the sons, grandsons, and great-grandsons of clergy on both sides of their families. Yet none of them, neither Samuel Jr., John, or Charles, adopted parish ministry as their vocations. Samuel Jr., of course, chose to be a schoolmaster, first as head usher at Westminster School for 20 years, and then as master at Blundell School in Devon for six. He emulated his father in writing poetry, but he didn't want to discharge the duties of a parish. Neither John nor Charles ever received appointment to their own parish livings. 
John was briefly curate to his father at Root near Epworth for two years from 1726 to eight, but didn't hold a parish appointment thereafter. Charles was temporarily curate of St. Mary's Islington in 1735, but soon resigned when the congregation opposed his evangelical style of preaching. Both John and Charles, of course, have been missionaries in Georgia, but this doesn't seem to have encouraged them to pursue parish ministry as a lifelong career when they came back to England. It seems likely that the experience of their father as a Tory high churchman battling dissenters and low church opponents in his parish for nearly 40 years was sufficiently unattractive to deter them from seeking appointment to a parish. However much that his sons may have romanticized him after his death, during his lifetime, they couldn't have ignored the evidence that Samuel Wesley's life at Epworth had been one of conflict, hardship, misery, and privation. His mismanagement of his personal finances and political conflicts ended in imprisonment in 1705. And his struggle with neighbors and influential churchmen created an environment of almost permanent crisis during the childhoods of Samuel, John, and Charles. Their father's cattle were maimed, their crops destroyed, his rectory burnt down three times. His correspondence with his bishop, William Wake, was full of recrimination and reproaches. Moreover, the relations between John and Charles's parents were tense, if not openly hostile. Susanna defied Samuel because she disagreed with his political views. And as late as the 1720s, she said she, said she regretted her decision to marry him. John clearly didn't experience the breach of 1702 to three, during which Samuel lived away from Epworth for eight months. But the fragile truce that existed between his parents was probably evident to him and his brother. John Wesley acknowledged the tensions between his parents later in life. The haunting of the Epworth Rectory in 1716 to 1717 by a ghost, old Geoffrey, clearly fascinated Samuel Jr. and John Wesley, and they wrote to members of the family asking about it for details. Of all the explanations that could be given for it, John's own in 1784 in the Armenian magazine was the most remarkable. John Wesley argued that the haunting was due to his father's breach of his oath in 1701 not to live with his wife while she defied him in her Jacobite political views. But in fact, Samuel returned to the parish, apparently without Susanna's explicit agreement to obey him. Wesley's conclusion was, quote, I fear his vow was not forgotten before God, and this was the cause of the haunting. It was a bitter conclusion, and perhaps not one to bolster one's view of either marriage or parish ministry. So what debt did John Wesley owe to his father? If he avoided the example of parish ministry and regarded his childhood as tense and fractious. It seems to me there are a number of ways in which we can see Samuel's influence in John's life. John Wesley's political principles, his churchmanship, his attitudes to money and use of writing and ideas of marriage all seem to derive from Samuel rather than Susanna. And I want to take each of these in turn. Firstly, John's political views. Samuel Wesley's decision to conform to the Church of England in 1685 also marked a shift to strong Tory opinions. He abandoned the Whig association with dissent along with his dissenting principles. With the zeal of the convert, Samuel Wesley's Toryism became deep and wide. He went to Oxford two years after the Rye House plot had been discovered, which led the government and the university to declare certain Whig 
and Republican principles to be anathema. Tory Oxford taught Samuel Wesley that the subject's duty was to obey the king and it was a sin to resist his rule. So Samuel remained committed to James II throughout 1688, even composing a poem of thanksgiving for the birth of the new Prince of Wales in June 1688. The revolution of 1688 to nine must therefore have been difficult. And although he accepted that William and Mary were the legitimate monarchs, unlike Susanna, he never reconciled himself to the political consequences of the revolution. Consequently, Samuel resented the Toleration Act and regarded dissenters as schismatics. Schism, in Samuel Wesley's view, was a great sin, a temporal dismemberment of the body of Christ. In his parish, in convocation, and in public debates, he challenged the legitimacy of the Whig Revolution and sought to roll it back. He became a tribal Tory. For example, despite his urge to be involved with the societies for the Reformation of Manners, to which he preached a sermon uh, before one of the societies in London, he soon responded to the warnings of the Tory Archbishop Sharp of York and abandoned the societies. Sharp's objection was that the societies were dangerous since they were a mixture of Anglican and dissenting members. Wesley abandoned them in favor of an Anglican only parish society. A generation later, John Wesley found, found some of his father's Tory allies, such as Henry Sacheverell, deeply distasteful. And John reconciled himself to the Whig regime of George I. Samuel had introduced John Wesley to Sacheverell in 1719, in the hope that Sacheverell would use his influence in Oxford to ease John's entry to Christchurch. In fact, John Wesley and Henry Sacheverell didn't get on, and John Wesley felt deeply insulted when Sacheverell said he didn't have good enough Latin and Greek to enter Christchurch. Wesley certainly didn't intend to take lessons from someone like Sacheverell, who had come close to challenging the legitimacy of the revolution of 1688 and of the Hanoverian succession. Despite his reservations regarding extreme Tories like Sacheverell and his own support for the Hanoverian succession, John Wesley saw himself and proclaimed himself a Tory high churchman. He said, I am a high churchman, the son of a high churchman, bred up from my childhood in the highest notions of passive obedience and non-resistance. Henry Rack commented of this, that John Wesley seems to have adopted his father's Hanoverian Toryism rather than his mother's religious Jacobitism. Wesley's refusal to embrace his mother's Jacobitism was marked and robust. His attack on Jacobite principles led him to some quite extraordinary statements. In his Concise History of England in 1771, Wesley countered the suggestion that the Hanoverian dynasty, dynasty was alien to Britain. He did so by emphasizing that since they were descended from Matilda, the 12th century daughter of Henry I, unlike the Stuarts, the Hanoverians could claim long descent from the medieval monarchs of England. It was a remarkable contention and one that's testimony to John Wesley's virulent anti-Jacobitism. Moreover, John Wesley in his concise history claimed that one English king stood out as easily the worst ruler in history. That was Charles II. His detestation of the Stuarts was as fierce as his mother's support for them. In 1785, defending his older brother Samuel from claims that he was a Jacobite, he wrote, he was a Tory, so was my father, so am I but I am no more a Jacobite than I am a Turk. Like a good Tory, John Wesley not only supported 
the state and the king. He also rejected the rule of King Mob and was outraged, outraged when, as he put it, cobbler, tinker, porter and hackney coachman claimed to have a political voice. In his choice of university, Samuel was undoubtedly influential for Samuel, John and Charles. All three went to Christchurch, Oxford, the home of Oxford Toryism. Samuel clearly laboured to ensure that they all went to Christchurch, pulling strings to get John admitted in 1720. Samuel, of course, had been to Exeter College, Oxford, but in a little known fact, he also entered the University of Cambridge in 1694, when he incorporated at Corpus Christi College and took the degree of Master of Arts. Quite what lay behind Samuel Wesley's migration to Cambridge is unclear, especially in the light of the fact that by 1705, it was his old friends in Oxford who raised funds to get him out of the debtor's jail in Lincoln. Perhaps he felt it would be easier to obtain an MA there, or that the prevailing Whig atmosphere of the 1690s, it would be prudent to have links with the Whig University. But by the first years of the 18th century, he had reverted to his alma mater and wanted his sons to breathe the same Oxonian Tory air that he had done. John Wesley's strong high church Toryism is evident in his attitude to religious dissent. A key element in this was his stubborn refusal to abandon the Church of England. He said famously he lived and died a member of the Church of England. Schism, as his father called it, was beyond the pale for him. The church was the only measure of religious authenticity and authority that Wesley felt it could be relied upon. Anything else was unacceptable, and hence he refused to consider separation from the church. Wesley also retained the Tory principles of non-resistance or passive obedience to legitimate authority. This is undoubtedly the source of his reversal on the issue of support for colonial America. Before 1776, he saw that there were legitimate political grievances for colonists in America. He accepted that the stamp tax was onerous. But once a gun was fired against the king and the lawful authority of the state had been, resistant, had been resisted, he could no longer support the colonists. In a calm address to our American colonies, he argued the Tory case against raising a rebellion against the crown. Theologically, John Wesley was also indebted to his father. His as was, as I said, a high churchmanship, and it drew on 17th century ideas of the sacred nature of the church and the priesthood, rather than the high church tractarianism of the 19th century. Wesley's sense of the historic claims of the church are one of the key reasons why he didn't abandon Anglicanism. It also enabled him to regard baptism and conversion as vital to salvation, and the Eucharist as important, but not to the exclusion of other sacraments. Wesley's high churchmanship was rooted in the idea of primitivity, an 18th century idea, 18th century term for authenticity, and in the sense that closeness to the early church made Anglicanism the most genuine expression of Christianity. Revivalism was also a key element in high church Anglican, especially in forming religious societies to secure people in their faith and to propagate it. Revivalism was present in high church Anglicanism from the 1670s in the work of Anthony Hornick, and, and it can be seen in Wales in the first years of the 18th century. In this respect, John Wesley was representative of a continuing trend in Tory high church Anglicanism that saw revival as a key to salvation. Other clergy of this type can be seen in a number of bishops, but also among fellow evangelicals, such as Griffiths Jones of Llanthoro. From his father, John Wesley also inherited a fairly chaotic approach to money 
Samuel Wesley had been a poor manager of his income. Undoubtedly, he didn't collect anything like the full amount of tithes from his parishioners and farmed the glebe land of the parish poorly also. Some of this was due to the withholding of tithes by parishioners who resented his inflexible approach to moral issues and religious toleration. But a significant element was also Samuel Wesley's own ineffectiveness in farming the glebe and perhaps also in raising surplus fees. In both cases, his predecessor had chosen to use an agent and as a consequence, raised much more money. Samuel Wesley dispensed with the agent and was reliant upon his own limited acumen to raise his income. The result of Samuel Wesley's decision was that a wealthy living like Epworth, worth over 200 pounds a year, yielded perhaps only a third of its proper value, and as a result, the Wesleys grew up in poverty. From 1701, Samuel borrowed money heavily, first from clerical friends and later from political opponents. It was this that led him to jail in 1705. Samuel Wesley also badly mismanaged his brother's East India money, sent back to England for Samuel to hold, so that, when he handed, so that he handed over only a fraction of the true worth. Samuel Ansley consequently refused to leave any bequests to his brother-in-law. John Wesley was not as poor a manager of his money as his father, but he certainly adopted a relaxed attitude towards it. He embraced a view that God will provide. From 1726 to 1751, he had only a small income as a fellow of Lincoln College, Oxford. Once it became clear that he could earn money from writing and from collections from followers, he was lax in accounting for it. And Wesley could rely on wealthy benefactors to support him too. Later in life, the bookroom stewards, who managed Methodist income from book sales and other sources, despaired of his financial practices. Money slipped through his fingers, all for worthy ends, but without a clear business or accounting method. John Wesley, of course, operated on a scale far beyond his father's, and this meant that the connection could develop new systems of funding, which, of course, Clive Norris has so well described. But both were at best unworldly in their attitudes to money, because money was a means, not an end. Samuel and his son both saw writing in a similar way. It too was a source of money, but unlike money, it was also an end in itself. Samuel Wesley's early volume of poems, Maggots, uh, a maggot was an idea that you got in your head that you couldn't get out of your head rather than a, a literal uh, bug. Uh, but Mag Maggots was uh, quite consciously a, ra a way of raising funds. He wrote in the preface, why mayn't I have my chance as well as others? If I write silly enough, why mayn't my books sell as well as any Christmas tales or wonderments that has, first, that has been clapped into fist since bills were first invented? The same was the case with his contributions to his brother-in-law's magazine, The Athenian Mercury, in which Samuel owned a share. Some of his articles were frivolous, but most were serious and written to persuade readers to become more pious. He wrote a religious column which encouraged readers to ask questions and to raise issues which he could respond to. Among these, as we'll see, were questions about the supernatural and witchcraft. Samuel Wesley's later theological works, his 1893 Life of Christ uh, and his multi-volume history of the Old and New Testaments in verse and his 1920s dissertation on the book of Job were written for an educated readership, but they were also dedicated to the right people with an eye to preferment. They were worthy if indigestible and none obtained the popularity uh, of the writings of other 18th century churchmen such as John Tillotson. One writer compared Wesley to Richard Blackmore who was a byword for dullness. Wesley, with pen and poverty beset, and Blackmore versed in physic as in wit, 
for though this of Jesus, that of Job may sing, one bawdy play will twice their prophets bring. And had not both caressed the flattering crown, this had no knighthood seen and that no gown. In other words, Blackwood didn't Black, uh, sorry, Blackmore didn't win a knighthood and Wesley didn't get preferment. Nevertheless, Samuel Wesley had a clear purpose. Despite their relative indigestibility, Samuel Wesley hoped that the life of Christ and the history of the Old Testament in verse might be widely read and encourage piety. In fact, the scale of the works meant that few could afford them. The 1893 edition of The Life of Christ ran to 524 pages, and even when it was reprinted in 1697, it was 522, sorry, 252 pages. His history of the Old Testament in verse, which contained extensive woodcuts, was published in two volumes, each with over 350 pages. His history of the New Testament was at least only issued in a single volume, but was also over 350 pages. Neither of these last were reprinted. In terms of both making money and reaching a wide audience, Samuel Wesley's works were a failure, though his journalism in the Athenian Mercury was self-consciously popular. John's writings were, of course, much wider and more extensive, but with the same goals, to make money and to spread Christian teaching more widely. In the Wesley family, turning to writing was a natural means of expression of piety, as well as a way to earn money. John Wesley's books on history, geography, and all manner of other disciplines were often written to raise funds. John Wesley's ventures into serial publications, such as the Arminian magazine and his journal, took advantage of new forms of publication not widely available to his father. A new technology and means of transmission meant that John Wesley's work could occupy a middle ground between the lower chapbook type material of Samuel's maggots and the Athenian Mercury and the more rarefied market for Samuel's later work. John Wesley, in contrast, tended to occupy the middle of the market where by the 1750s, the literate classes had disposable income. Wesley's greatest achievement, of course, was the Christian Library, a heavily abridged anthology of Christian classical writings from the 17th and 18th centuries. It included works by theologians such as Jeremy Taylor and Richard Baxter. Wesley's digest of these writers heavily boiled down the original text, perhaps keeping as little as the tenth of the source material. He carefully edited out content that he disagreed with, such as predestination. It was a recommended cycle of reading of practical divinity and an attempt to make piety and religious literature as clear as possible. Like Samuel's work, this was an elephantine project, but far outstripping his father's scale, running to 14,000 pages of material. In the short term, it was a financial flop, the print run was only 100 volumes. But in the long term, it was a clear statement of the seriousness of Methodism and of its debt to an antecedent body of theology. In this respect, John and Samuel were cut from the same cloth. An aspect of divinity on which Samuel and John agreed was the imminence of the supernatural. Both John and Samuel believed that God was close to the world and intervened in it to ensure his plan for humankind. He did this in all sorts of guises, some natural, some supernatural, such as portents and spirits. They also believed the devil was similarly involved in the world and that witchcraft and sin were ever present dangers. Samuel Wesley preached against witchcraft in Epworth in 1716, when there were the rumors of activity in the neighborhood and he clearly regarded old Jeffrey as a real and supernatural phenomenon. So did John Wesley. In an era in which God was more distanced from the world in the human imagination, Samuel and John Wesley resisted that movement. In 1762, John Wesley gave great credence to the cock-laying ghost, more so than the rest of the Church of England. 
Wesley even sponsored a public debate between the Methodist John Moore and the Anglican Stephen Aldrich, the vicar of St. John's Clerkenwell. The public examination of the existence of the ghost was largely due to the insistence of Wesley and the Methodists that it was real. Uh, in fact, of course, we know that it was a, a put up job between a father and a daughter uh, and a complete hoax. Wesley's attitude to marriage were also perhaps due to his father. Samuel Wesley undoubtedly adopted the Tory high church view that all authority came from God and that just as the king was God's representative on earth, so a husband and a father were set over a family to rule and govern it. He did not expect to be opposed. A wife's role was to be an obedient helpmeet, albeit one with whom one hoped to live in harmony. In the bedroom, as elsewhere, a wife was expected to submit to her husband. Samuel Wesley's outrage that Susanna had been defying him when it came to accepting the revolution of 1688 was principally because she was not obedient to his judgment about the legitimacy of the king. His phrase, if you and I have two kings, we must have two beds, captured the sense that Samuel believed Susanna had overturned the natural order in defying him as much as the regicides had done in executing Charles I. We don't know exactly how or whether Samuel and Susanna resolved their quarrel after Samuel's eight months absence from Epworth, but it seems most likely that Samuel gave Susanna her forgiveness, even though she didn't abandon her opinions privately. As indicated earlier, John, Wesley's, uh, John Wesley ascribed the rectory ghost, old Geoffrey, to his parents' quarrel and to divine unhappiness that Susanna had not been truly obedient to her husband, and perhaps even that Samuel knew this, but lived with her anyway. In John Wesley's eyes, therefore, not only was a husband to, obeyed, to be obeyed and submitted to, but that not to do so had serious consequences. This experience didn't encourage John Wesley towards marriage. His flirtations in Oxford with Kitty Hargreaves and Sally Kirkham seemed to have reflected his ambivalence. So did his experience with Sophie Hopke in Georgia. In that case, his desire to be married, but his reluctance to go through the process, led to a breach which in some ways resembles his father's response to Susanna. In February 1737, he told Sophie, who he had spent considerable time with as both tutor and pastor, that he would not marry her until, until his mission to the native Indians was complete. Wesley seems to have regarded this as an engagement and assumed Sophie's agreement. When a month later, she announced her engagement to Mr. Williamson, Wesley was outraged. By the summer of 1737, when Sophie stayed away from his religious society meetings and had not undertaken the required preparation for the Eucharist, he refused to admit her to communion. This punitive model of both marriage and relationships with, is one which is redolent of Samuel's. Denial of communion and denial of presence were rooted in the same pattern. John Wesley's subsequent engagement to Grace Murray in 1748 was perhaps born of the sense that she had served him well as a nurse and was from a lowly family and therefore would be a compliant wife. His eventual wife, Mary Vizail, had also nursed him, this time from a badly bruised ankle. They were married in 1751 after just a week's engagement. Wesley's treatment of Mary was thoughtless. He didn't give up writing to, or, uh, sorry, writing to and meeting young women, and he didn't show her the affection that she wanted. When she found evidence of his emotional comments about the blessing of his correspondence with one woman, she was infuriated. Her frustration led to violence. On one occasion, she dragged John across the room by a handful of hair, which was witnessed by a servant. When Mary accused him of adultery, he left for Ireland saying, I, shall ho I hope I shall see your wicked face no more. The marriage lasted until 1758 when they were separated. 
after an attempt to reconcile came to nothing, Wesley wrote, for what cause I know not, my wife set out for Newcastle, purposing never to return. Non am reliqui, non dimisi, non revocabo. I did not forsake her, I did not dismiss her, I will not recall her. If we look beyond the lives of John and Charles Wesley, in 1768, the noted churchman Samuel, sorry, Christopher Wilberforce, became Bishop of Lincoln, a post he held for 16 years. In his time at Lincoln, he spent much of it bemoaning the separation of the Wesleyans, as he called them, from the Church of England. In 1873, he wrote a pastoral letter to the Wesleyans, which ran to three editions. In it, he advocated reunion and placed the responsibility on the Church of England. He also made claims that scandalized the church. He wrote, it has been alleged that the prevalence of Wesleyanism is partly due to the careless incapacity or immorality of some pastors of the church. I fully believe it. But he defended the church on exactly the same grounds that Samuel Wesley did in his debate with dissenters. Its sacraments, liturgy, apostolic nature, and the sinfulness of schism. Wordsworth claimed that in Epworth Rectory at Churchyard on the south side of the chancel is the gravestone of John's venerable father, Samuel Wesley, 39 years rector of that parish, who as the epitaph on it declares, died as he lived, quote, in the true Catholic faith of the undivided and ever blessed Trinity and the Godhead of Jesus Christ. On that stone, John Wesley stood and preached. Brethren, Wordsworth wrote, if your revered founder, John Wesley, were to rise from the grave, what would his feelings be? What would be his language? If he stood once more on his father's grave at Etworth, inscribed with that profession of faith to which I have referred. Wordsworth went on to cite all the assertions of John Wesley that he remained within the Church of England and that, quote, none who regard my judgments will ever separate from it. He emphasized that John's father viewed schism as a deadly sin. Wordsworth even went on to claim that John Wesley would not be a Wesleyan because Methodism had strayed so far from his and his father's principles. In a second tract on ecclesiastical legislation, Wordsworth again bemoaned the secession of the Wesleyans from the church an act, he said, from which we have not yet recovered. But like Samuel Wesley, he thought all of this derived from the ill effects of the revolution of 1688 and the secession of the non-jurors from the church. This was exactly what Samuel Wesley thought. In conclusion, what Bishop Wordsworth was identifying was how far Methodism had come from Samuel Wesley's conception of the church and to a considerable degree, John Wesley's principles also. Wordsworth also saw that the edifice John Wesley had created was very much in the image of his father's ideals of a national church in which revivalism was central to the ministry of the clergy and in which high church Anglicanism was the means of salvation. Wordsworth saw that by the second half of the 19th century, Methodism had traveled far from the starting point. But that doesn't mean that John Wesley's debt to his father was inconsiderable, quite the reverse. Methodism in the first half of the 19th century transformed itself from John Wesley's limited conception of it into a national denomination. As scholars rediscover the ingredients in John Wesley's thinking, it was from his father, not, that his, not his mother, that they find most influence. So perhaps there should be less talk of Susanna as the mother of Methodism, and more of Samuel as the father. Thank you. Many thanks, Phil, for that fantastic lecture outlining um, John Wesley and Charles Wesley's debt uh, to their father and contrasting that with the traditional picture uh, of the debt uh, Wesley owed to his, to his mother. Uh, we usually have some time for questions after the annual lecture. 
Um, perhaps if we take questions from the room first and then online afterwards, would that make more sense? Yeah, I shall look around the room and see if there are any questions bubbling up in the attenders' minds. I can't see anything just yet. Okay, anything online? Anybody have a question online? Nothing at the moment. John? Your sound is off just now, John. You're on mute a minute, John. Yeah, I think I'm on. I'm, I, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Thank you. Yes. Many thanks, Bill. Um, I think you're very, you've very clearly demonstrated how Samuel Wesley rejects the politics of dissent. I wonder, was Samuel's rejection of dissent total? Therefore, did he not necessarily reject the theology of dissenters? And therefore, did he bequeath to John Wesley a kind of Puritan DNA that helps us understand John Wesley more? Thank you. Uh, John, that's a fascinating question. I think John, uh, Samuel's rejection of uh, dissent was, it seems to me, utter and complete. Um, there doesn't seem to me to be any shred of dissent that he retains any commitment for after his um, con conformity to the Church of England. He has a, a furious debate with Samuel Parker in the period between 1703 and 1708, uh, in which they fight backwards and forwards about uh, dissenter education, dissenter involvement in politics. Um, and it seems to me that uh, Samuel Wesley completely abandons uh, dissent. Um, so I'm not sure that I could trace any mm. element in, in uh, Samuel Wesley or John Wesley's thinking, which was indebted to uh, the dissenters. Um, Samuel Wesley's dislike of dissenters was so strong <laughs> um, that, of course, it leads him in his own parish to prosecute dissenters who don't get married in church, prosecute dissenters who uh, refuse to bring their children to be baptised. So I think the breach with dissent in, in John's case is uh, complete. Uh, that, of course, isn't the case with Susanna, where I think you can see strands of Puritanism in Susanna's thinking. Um, so if I if I had to identify a route between uh, John Wesley and uh, Puritanism of the 17th century, it would be Susanna rather than Samuel, I'm afraid. Mm, thank you. Peter, I think you had a question. Yes, well, thank you. Um, uh, if you if you come up and use the microphone, you'll be able to be heard. Peter. My, my question is about um, your uh, your reading of Samuel West's and John West's attitudes to money. Mm -hmm. My my perception is that John West was actually a much better manager of his money. Um, and, and that, in fact, his his management of money reacted against his father's profligacy. Um, but what he was actually, um, he, he, let's say, his his accounting was more creative, <laughs> uh, and and his um, his, 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 his much more, he seems to be much more abstemious, abstemious in some ways. I don't know whether you want to comment on that. Yes, I mean that's. Um... It's difficult to be precise about this. As I said, John Wesley's financial circumstances are on a completely different scale from Samuel's. Um, it seems to me that Samuel is incompetent with his money in absolutely every possible sphere. He mismanages debts. He can't farm the glee properly. He can't extract tithes. He can't extract surplus fees. So there's, it seems to me there's no area of Samuel's life, including publishing, where he's very good with money. Uh, John, on a much bigger scale, is, you're, you're right, much more successful. After all, he builds uh, the Methodist Connection, which has secure financial roots. But you're right also, it's his personal attitude to money. Um, he, As you say, he's not lavish with it, but there are these accounts of money just passing through his hands um, and and there being no proper accounting. 
And I think both come from a source which is money isn't important, that, that money is simply a kind of aspect of uh, promoting faith um, and therefore to, to account for it and to manage it better is, is somehow too worldly. John Lenton in the room. Um, three questions. Well, if you can ask three questions, John, you'll have to come and use the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> um, three questions, Bill. Um, first of all, this um, question of um, what was important about uh, Methodism and what way was uh, Methodism different. I would argue that one of the most important ways in which uh, Methodism was different under John and Charles Wesley, particularly in the sort of 1738 to 1742 period, uh, the genesis of Methodism, uh, was in that both of them preached outside the parish. And it's that major change which continues over the rest of their lives, um, which um, separates them from um, particularly Samuel Wesley. Uh, and then secondly, um, there's the question of Charles Wesley. Now, you had a lot in your lecture, Bill, about uh, links between Samuel and John. Um, you said very little relative about Charles. And yet, to many of us today, Charles would seem to be at least as important as John, as the founder of Methodism, if only because we still sing Charles Wesley's hymns and his theology uh, still influences us. Um, and undoubtedly, when you look at Methodism in the period from 1738 to the present, uh, hymns and singing has, have always been vital. Uh, and um, uh, again, when you look back at the two parents. Um, um, Samuel seems to be not so interested in, let's say, singing, uh, whereas uh, Susanna um, surely was more interested in singing and uh, influenced her sons on in those ways. Uh, and then the third question, um, this whole point about uh, Methodism, what did John Wesley think he was doing? Uh, now, you made a very good point that John Wesley stayed within the Church of England uh, and said, I will stay within the Church of England until my dying day. Uh, and yet, on the other hand, uh, as some 19th century um, author put it, John Wesley was pulling strongly uh, in the opposite direction, even if he was looking at the church from which he was leaving. Um, so... What's the sort of direction of Methodism? Uh, the direction of Methodism is surely away from the Church of England uh, because of what John and Charles did, uh, even if they did not intend it. Uh, and so if the direction was away, surely this is more influenced by Susanna with her um, um, opposition to her husband's rules within the parish. Uh, and holding the meetings and all the rest of it, rather than uh, the influence of Samuel. Uh, thank you, John. That's almost uh, almost a, a Wesley lecture in itself. Um, of the three points, I, I think the first point is a very good one, that uh, John Wesley chafes against parish structures um, and steps outside the parish structures. Um, and I, I don't think I disagree with you, that that is a feature of John John and Charles and Samuel's um, uh, behavior, which is in contrast to their father's. Samuel Wesley's view is that he, he remained within Etworth. Uh, he was a Church of England man. He, was, he could only operate within his own parish. Um, John and Charles step outside that, and I think that is a contrast. Um, as far as Charles is concerned, in many ways, I see Charles as much more akin to his father uh, because he's much more a, a, a middle of the road, relatively vanilla um, Anglican. Um, you're right, I think his music is significant um, and that may well represent a debt to, to Susanna, 
I'm not sure about that entirely, but um, I would say that that Charles is um, much more inclined theologically to uh, support Samuel's uh, mainstream Anglicanism. The last point about John's chafing against the structures of the church is perhaps for me the most interesting because you're quite right. Although he makes those comments about living and dying as a member of the Church of England, he behaves in a way which is quite uh, antithetical to the Church of England. He field preaches, which is quite irregular. Uh, he preaches outside anybody's licensing, uh, which is uh, uncanonical. Um, he certainly, in uh, ordaining or setting apart superintendents, uh, violates Anglican discipline. Um, and you might say this is an example of uh, John Wesley having his cake and eating it. He he, he uh, remains within the Church of England as a member and nominally uh, and as a clergyman, but he rejects its discipline and its rules. Um, John, of course, would perhaps argue that each of those instances of breaking the rules had uh, exigent cases behind them. Uh, but I think Samuel would probably not accept those exigent cases. Indeed, in the one instance that we know of, Samuel's preaching before the societies for the Reformation of Manners, once it's pointed out to him that this is a breach of the rules um, by Archbishop Sharp, he toes the line and abandons the societies for the Reformation of Manners and says, OK, I'll set up my own hmm. society in my parish. So uh, certainly as far as um, following the rules, John is a departure from Samuel's uh, example. David. Uh, and I think we've got Clive online with a question as well. I don't know whether this is significant enough, but having been in Epworth for 11 years, uh, we thought Samuel Wesley had just been an eccentric, but we found that in the 1830 archdiaconal visitation of Epworth, one of the, the major issue was that the parishioners of Epworth uh, insisted that they cease the baptism by immersion of children in the parish church that had been instituted by Samuel Wesley uh, because of the dangers to their children. Now, everyone I spoke to in the Lincoln Diocese did seem to think this was, gosh, if this is true, this is quite exceptional. And perhaps he wasn't so uh, rigid in the Anglican church as he might have been. I'll just offer that as a suggestion. Yes, the, the issue, 18th century debates on baptism are thick and uh, fully developed. And um, I would not be, I don't think I'd be properly qualified theologically to step into the debate between immersion and sprinkling, um, or, or indeed Samuel's own practice in Etworth. What we do know is that Samuel took the view that because dissenting clergy weren't in his view, validly ordained, they simply practiced what he called lay baptism. Um, and therefore, their form of baptism was a lesser form of baptism. Samuel himself was outraged in 1713 when a group of bishops of the Church of England stepped forward and say, actually, lay baptism is valid. It's always been valid in the church. It's been valid in all churches. Um, and Samuel finds that quite offensive. Um, but I'm not sure about the practice of uh, immersion or sprinkling at Epworth. I, I, I'm very interested in that, and I'd be grateful if you could point me in that direction as well. Clive. Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, one thing that John Wesley was remarkable for was his personal regimen, the way in which he used to rise early, his very disciplined approach to prayer and Bible study and so on. And I've always linked that in my own mind primarily to his upbringing by Susanna in terms of the way she ran the household. But I wonder, are there aspects of John Wesley's personal discipline which you might trace more to the influence of his father? Well, that's a very good question, Clive. In fact, I'm not sure I would entirely ascribe, ascribe John Wesley's kind of ascetic practices uh, just to Susanna. Uh, Samuel's rules for the Etworth Parish Society were pretty stringent. Um, for example, he insisted that workers in the field 
should always undertake a, undertake a cycle of prayer before they went out to work in the fields. And when uh, the labourers said, well, this was a terribly burdensome and that some of them had to walk two or three miles to where they were working, uh, Samuel Wesley's response was, uh, A, it does only takes a few minutes to do a prayer, and B, while you're work, walking to your uh, place of work, then you can also undertake your cycle of prayer. Um, so I, I think there were elements of that kind of uh, quite demanding, rigorous uh, religious regimen that um, comes from Samuel as well as Susanna. In other respects, of course, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't think there's evidence about, for example, uh, Samuel Wesley's diet. I don't think there are any, there's any evidence of what he recommended people should or shouldn't eat or drink. Um, so I, I, I don't think I could make a claim that that came from, from, from Samuel rather than Susanna. Um, and of course, we shouldn't exclude other in, in, influences. Uh, we know that, for example, uh, George Whitfield was a very strong influence, very strong voice uh, on the issue of what you could and couldn't eat and drink. Um, including tea and that kind of thing. Any other questions or observations or comments? David, I assume there's none that you've identified. Okay. David, I think you're muted, but... Um... Sorry. Uh, right. nothing, nothing online yet. Uh, last chance, perhaps anybody online want to come in and, and ask? Uh, Peter's got a last question. That this will have to be the last one. But okay. Okay. Right, this is going to be a naughty one. <laughs> um, the, the one person who has, who's, who's, who's almost been the, 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 the elephant in the room is, is Samuel Jr. Had Samuel Jr. lived another 20 years, how do you think things would have been different? Uh, that's a naughty question, it's, Peter. It's related to the whole it, subject. It's a naughty question in part because I think it's probably unanswerable. Um, <laughs> I, I really don't know. Uh, uh, I think in some ways you can see Samuel Jr. as very strongly influenced by his father. His poetic interests um, uh, 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 seem to me to be very similar to his father. Both of them were masters of dog doggerel, I'm afraid. Neither of them were great poets, but they put huge time and energy into their poetry. Um, and they certainly saw poetry as very important to them. Um, but what would have happened 20, if, if he did for another 20 years? I'm, I'm afraid that's uh, something I, I don't think I can stray into, I'm afraid. Uh, you will have noticed, uh, final thing to say, you will have noticed that we've been scrolling through some of the images from the Wesley Historical Society Library uh, here at Harcourt Hill in the background. So those of you who've been seeing images pass over the PowerPoint, uh, these are items owned by the Society uh, in, in its collections. Over to you, David. Thank you, Bill. That's wonderful. And thanks to whoever put together the PowerPoint. It's been great to see some of those images and some of the rich resources available in uh, with you there uh, at the WHS library. But thanks very much, Bill, for, for a terrific lecture and all those who've asked questions and teased out uh, some aspects of it as well. We'll look forward to seeing the lecture in print in due course in the proceedings of the society. And it'll be good to read and reflect on it more uh, then. Next year, our annual lecture will be held in Manchester uh, at the Nazarene College, and the lecture will be Julie Lunn, who will be speaking on an aspect of Charles Wesley's poetry uh, and verse, the specific title um, still to be confirmed. Uh, so watch this space, but uh, same week uh, next year for the WHS 2024 lecture. Thanks very much, everybody, uh, for coming, those online uh, and those who've made the trip to Oxford uh, as well. And let's uh, end our gathering by expressing our thanks to Bill uh, for his lecture in the usual way. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, Bill.
does that end the uh, I think that ends the broadcast. The broadcast.